This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And we are about a week out at, at time of recording from, is that right, from going to Scablands? Yeah, we're leaving Monday. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're leaving Monday. Flying out Monday. Uh, not sure when this will be published, but we're flying out Monday as of, as of right now. And uh, we're, we're very excited about that. Randall, are we going to be talking about that area today, or what's, what's the plan? Where are we going to be going today? Um, oh, so we have to have a plan. Gotta I mean, we're just going to wing it. I kind of a plan, purely improvisational. Well, that's that was that's what I've been pushing for. But you guys seem to be set on having plans, so I yeah. figured. You Actually, I do have, have a one. rough outline of okay. where we're going to go and what we're going to be talking about, and um, yeah, I do because we have kind of been leading up to this with uh, our journey around North America and looking at the various flood evidence. And now we're getting to where some of the most spectacular flood evidence on the entire planet is to be found. And we kind of left off by following the Bonneville flood up along the snake. And we ended up at Tammany Bar, I recall. And Tammany Bar was where the, um, the very coarse um, Bonneville flood sediments, the bouldery, gravelly Bonneville flood sediments being washed up out of Utah and Southern Idaho and, and Hell's Canyon were overlain by Missoula flood back flood silts. So that was where the two floods met the two great floods, the Bonneville flood and the Missoula flood, both named for their respective lakes from which they presumably originated. Lake Bonneville in Utah, Lake Missoula in western Montana. And what is the connection between those two particular floods, if any? I think that's a worthwhile question. And it seems to me that, I, and I get the impression that there's not considered to be any necessarily genetic connection between the two, that they're just independent events. Uh, probably even separated by centuries, if not millennia. But that's something that has to be addressed is the the dating. And this is what everything is going to be coming down to. This is crucial, dating. To try to correlate these different events, we need precise dating. So uh, big issue, big issue there, dates. Because without the dates, we can't correlate. You know, the question that I raised is how much time elapsed between deposition of the coarse Bonneville floods sediments at Tammany Bar and the deposition of the slack water, the slow water silts that were being back flooded up the snake from the, uh, from the Missoula flood, set, uh, flood currents that produced the Cheney Palouse scab land. So we're going to kind of pick it up from there, I think, and we're going to take spend a couple of episodes touring the uh, the Great Pacific Northwest floodlands, which would include both the Scablands itself, the basin of Lake Missoula, which is in western Montana, the Scablands, by the way, eastern Washington, and also a traverse of the Columbia River from the Tri Cities area at Wallula Gap all the way down past Portland. Uh, and through the gorge where the Columbia River cuts across the uh, Cascade Mountain Range. So we're going to take a couple of episodes to kind of do that tour around. And um, yes, we're going to only actually see a small part of that in our, in our five-day tour coming up. We're going to focus on the scablands of eastern Washington. In fact, we won't get out of eastern Washington. But if you want to comprehend the whole flood, the whole range of flood landscapes, you have to travel all the way from the Pacific Ocean there at Astoria, which is right on the coast, um, up the Columbia, 
uh, across through the gorge um, and up to the Big Bend country where it wraps around the Columbia Basalt Plateau, eastern Washington, and then right on through uh, the panhandle of Idaho and on into Montana. So in that route, you'd be looking at things like uh, Multnomah Falls, for example, uh, which is a byproduct of the uh, flood erosion that left sheer cliffs after its passage. Um, so that would, in, that would encompass the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. So it's a lot of territory to cover, and it can't be covered in one week. It could easily take two weeks minimum to cover pretty much. And I think we've done that several times, spent close to two weeks. Um, maybe in getting as far as from Portland into Montana. Um, so anyways, I think we'll pick it up right there where we kind of left off right there along the snake and, uh, where the snake river, um, flows across the Southern part of the basalt plateau and where it met the floods coming North, um, from the area of Spokane, Washington. And then we'll kind of look at it there and then we'll, we can divert east, and that would go into the, and I will put quotes around it, the lake basin, and then we can go north and west, and that would be covering the Scablands area, looking at the big coolies and stuff, and then we'll follow that by kind of essentially following the pathway of the flood. We'll imagine that we're in a rubber raft being swept along in the flood surge that's a thousand feet deep and we're hanging on for dear life, but we're looking at the, we're being carried out uh, from Montana out across the plateau down through the gorge. And ultimately we end up in the Pacific ocean. So if you can imagine that particular route, let's assume we, we get in our raft when it's at the far distal reservoirs of Lake Missoula. And then we just follow the flood from there out to the Pacific. So I think that's a that's a a semi logical approach to it. So, anyways, well, uh, before, how does that yeah, sound? That sounds good. Uh, and next I week, have, you guys. I have one question though before we. Before oh, you we have get a question? That, yeah, one question. What What do you mean by precise dating? Like, how precise does it need to be? Well, within a decade, anyway. Oh, yeah, that's precise. or closer. That's very precise. Yeah, because, you know, in other words, going back to the Tammany Bar outcrop, you know, it makes a big difference if the if yeah. the uh, the passage of time between the two depositional environments was, you know, a year, a couple of years, a matter of weeks or months or a, a century. Yeah, and I think the best methods we have, even for something that relatively recent, is that is many hundreds of years in terms of margins of error. So uh, unless they find big enough pieces of wood in there to match it up to tree ring dating somehow, I don't think you're going to get anything more precise than that. No, I right think, now. yeah, radiocarbon dating would be, I'm guessing the, but you know, again, if it's a flood, it could sweep up and re re entrain older material. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just I just don't even, know how much dating has been done. I, I've not been able to get a hold of, um, Jim O'Connor's paper yet. I, I, I have it, I think somewhere I tried to get a, uh, another copy of it and I will be able to shortly, but, yeah. uh, right now I've got to reinstate my library privileges and then I'll be able to get it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just saying that the, I think that the, the general rule of dating is, is the older the date the bigger the margin of error. Correct. So we're and looking at, you know, 12 to 15,000 years ago. Which say. is still going to give us margins of error of hundreds of years uh, with current technology for the most part. Yes. Yeah. So we'd have to go by other things. like Yeah. And one of the questions I raise is if there is a significant passage of time over the Bonneville flood sediments and the deposition of the, uh, the slack water silts, um, there should be some evidence of some type of vegetation growing there. Right. There should be seeds, there should be pollen, there should be, you know, 
the remains of whatever was growing there. And obviously, the longer that that sedimentary deposit is going to be exposed to the atmosphere, uh, the more time it's going to have to develop a whole ecosystem. Yeah. That, see, and that's key, too, to understanding these the flood phenomena is at what point does it switch from being erosional to depositional? You see, now, if you've got slack water sediments that are, you know, in a stilling basin where the water has slowed down and even almost come to a stop, well, you're going to get real fine-grained stuff, and it's going to be purely depositional. It's not going to be eroding what's there. It's going to be burying what's there. And it could contain pollen if it was there long enough, right? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, mean, let's assume you've got a landscape, and there's a fully developed ecosystem that you would have after a century or two, right, you're going to have some, you're going to have trees, you're going to have some kind of shrubs, you're going to have grasses of different kinds. Yeah, you're going to have a bunch of stuff growing there. Now you have a back flood that comes in that's low energy, and it would basically dump its load of mud onto those that landscape that's there, and there should be evidence. I mean, we find fossilized leaves that are millions of years old. Yeah sandwiched in rocks right so there there should be something there and if there's not why not right and yeah so I, that that to me is it would be crucial and that's why i would love to get back and spend some time at that one outcrop and hang out at the at the quarry there and i'm sure they must have a geologist on staff because to me that that particular outcrop right there at that location is is really key because it's if we take the more orthodox view, there's nothing really. There's no. They're just two individual events that bear no relation to each other. The Bonneville flood, which is this great Lake Bonneville bursting through a sedimentary dam in northern Utah, right? Um, Lake Missoula, the Missoula flood, named after Lake Missoula, which bursts through a glacial ice dam in Montana. So they're basically both ultimately explained by dam failures in one case glacial ice in the other case a sedimentary plug that was in the uh uh in in the uh what is now red rock pass so you have two big lakes they drain through dam bursts outburst floods and their their deposits meet there at tammany bar near lewiston and clarkston right and then we can actually see that the Missoula flood sediments are juxtaposed upon the Bonneville flood sediments. And so the question I want to know is, is how much time has elapsed between the deposition of those two very distinct types of material? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to stop until I have the answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you better just stay out of my way. Okay. Cause I'm going to find out, man. Well, see, okay. So there's only two possibilities. Either they have no relation to each other and they're just sort of a coincidental event that they happen to meet at that spot or they are connected somehow. Yeah. And, Again, if they're if they're two or three or four centuries apart, well, then they're I would say uh, clearly different events. But if you do dating, and that dating shows that they all both date to the same year or two, yeah. well, now we can't rule out that they're happening essentially simultaneous. That there's very little passage of time between the Bonneville flood coarse sediments and the fine grained Missoula flood sediments. Yeah, and so they might be part of the same event. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I just wanted to know how precise you thought the dating needed to be. That's all. So, well, given, see, I mean, really we need, I, you know, ideally we'd like to have it down to less than a year. Yeah. That's because then you can make some inferences that you couldn't make if your, if your, uh, precision was only a half century or a century. Yeah. All right. But you know, when you're looking at ice scores, you can essentially get down to less than five years resolution, even down possibly to a year. Yeah. With ice cores. With ice cores. Yeah. With ice cores. Or tree ring. Or tree ring. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, if perhaps 
some logs could be found. That's what I was saying. If there's pieces of wood in there, tree ring dating, yeah. might be able to narrow it down. But so far, but every other dating I know of is going to have centuries in terms of margins of error. Right. And the farther back the date is, the, the bigger the margin. That's just how it is. Yeah. The farther back, the, yeah, the bigger the margin. Usually, the, like for, for, you know, for the, the, the margins of error are given as like a percentage of the, of the, of the date. It'll be between five and ten percent of the total number of years, uh, you know, in the past that the event took place. Uh-huh. So the farther back the date is, the bigger the margin of error, no matter what kind of dating method you're using, unless it's tree ring or ice core, like you were saying. But anyway, right. well, that just, makes just sense. a question. So yeah, let's 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 move forward to uh, to the areas you were talking about. To the big well, canoe. Yeah, let's go to the raft. Where are we starting? Well. I thought I'd go back to Tammany Bar. And well, I mean, we've covered that pretty extensively, so I didn't want. Well, to- I'm not gonna. I'm just talking about basically not spending any time there, just departing from there. Well, we had a we had another episode after Tammany Bar, and I think we got into a lot of the Snake River uh, through Washington and uh, a lot of the Cheney Palouse Palouse Falls. Testing my okay. memory here six weeks later, but uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that we, sounds good. Then we'll pick it up there. Um, yeah, so if anybody wants to know, I mean, yeah, in our just discussion we just had, um, about uh, Tammany Bar, you can go back what two episodes, and we've got the, the photographs there. All right. So yeah, we've um, looked at it many times. So, yeah, we're going to have a little quiz. Uh oh. To get <laughs> um, to move forward, you got to <laughs> prove what you knew going backward. Okay. So share screen. Yeah, we're all like, yeah, we already know all that stuff. Then he yeah, asks this like question, like, uh. Uh. <laughs> okay, I want to go back to this graphic for a minute. Okay. What's wrong with this graphic? And what's right about the graphic? (laughs) What can we say about this graphic? Well, I think you, I remember you telling us that it's not certain that all those areas were covered with water at the same time. You're you're on the right track. Yes. Okay. Okay. If we go to the conventional view, this makes no sense. If we go to the alternate view, this makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 makes that, lake, sense. that lake is not big enough to fill up all that other area with water. Right. When you have water, it's showing here the maximum flood extent throughout yeah. the Channel Scab lands, down the Columbia, and even into the Willamette Valley. If you've got water filling Willamette Valley up to 400 feet deep up in the Portland area, Glacial Lake Missoula ain't there no more. It's drained. Yeah, it's an empty lake basin. There. What's that, Brad? They still got the dam there in the image blocking the lake back. Right. So this is showing this is showing the lake being full at full pool, and it's showing the maximum hydrograph of the Missoula flood. It's showing the entire Scabland area submerged. It's showing Lake uh Lake um Dam. Can you help me out here? This brand, the, the lake just downstream from uh, Lula Gap. Well, that's Umatilla down Ooh, there. Lake Umatilla, right? Lake Umatilla, and then the Willamette Valley. I, I don't know if it has an actual lake name, but that, the Willamette Valley is is shown at full pool as well. So by the time you've got this water down here, this water up here is gone. Now, in the alternative view, what you've got is an accelerated melting. In the back to Brett's view, is very first idea and which was sort of reinvigorated with the 1999 uh john shaw paper which was entitled back to brett's is that there was an accelerated melting of the southern sector of the cordier and ice sheet right well if that's the case you could have this because if you have meltwater discharging from the eastern lobes of the Cordillera and Ice Sheet, it's going to be discharging into the Missoula Basin. From the western lobes, or I would say the central lobes, the western lobes would be over here, Puget Sound and all of that. But if you've got water discharging from those lobes, um, you know, 
in other words, if you've got discharges emanating from across the southern margin of the ice sheet, yes, then you could have this. In fact, you probably would have something like this with water backflowing into Lake Missoula. And then at some point, but not within a half century or a century, within a matter of days, the water rising against the, uh, the, the Purcell trench lobe and destroying it utterly. You see, and How then long does it take to make strand lines, uh, in the, in the, in Lake Missoula, right? Isn't there pretty significant strand lines throughout that area? Oh yeah, you. Oh yeah, there's Are strand they in lines. Rock or? Yeah, there's strand lines in in you know right in Missoula. There's strand lines down in the Buffalo Range. Yeah, there's all kinds of strand lines throughout the basin, showing that there was a huge volume of water there. That's what I'm saying. That there was a huge volume of water, but, yeah, but it was full be. pool at the time. The entire Scabland tracks were inundated. Right, That's the for, alternative version for the strand lines to still exist today. They must have been etched pretty strongly into the landscape right which means, oh yeah, yeah yeah absolutely okay which means yeah. the lake and i mean be there in, for in the area while. in the in the uh, uh missoula valley itself where the town of missoula is the water was a thousand feet deep there yeah and all up in the mission valley which is, if you look at my cursor here it, it goes up which in, includes what would now be uh flathead lake it was also a thousand feet deep the strand the uppermost strand lines are four thousand two hundred feet above sea level so all you got to do is you can use Google Earth and you can just roll your mouse over and it'll give you the the elevation of the ground surface. So if the elevation is 1,000 feet above sea level, then you know that it's another 1,200 feet up to 4,200 feet, that, which was the maximum water level of Lake Missoula. And I say Lake Missoula um, just because that is the term that is used to describe and name this particular body of water, which is almost exclusively in Montana. So you think those strand lines could have been made quickly? Well, I would think, what do you mean by quickly? Well, we have a little pond, right? And it goes up and down yep. and it makes strand lines within days. It makes days. strand lines. Yeah, in days. But I don't expect those strand lines to survive 12,000 years because they were not really etched very deeply into the landscape. They're just well, now kind of your pond, let's see, because now your pond is not 600 cubic miles of water, is it? No, it's not, right. Okay, so that's your basic difference right there, plus the fact that it's a pond. Now, I think what we're looking at here is basically a giant temporary back flood. But it, so you think that it, just because it's that big, it could make strand lines that would last a very long time, even in, even if they if only it only took it a year to make them or something like that. Oh, it may have taken only a few weeks to a few months to make them. Okay. Yeah, so because look, you you can have you can go in 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 a basin. I I you know I could pull up pictures here. I maybe should do that after the break during the break. Find some, but yeah, you can go where you've had a a, a flood. Let's say a ten year flood which has risen above. So if you've had, it's been 10 years since you've had a flood like that, whatever was there was probably obscured, but you have a flood like that. And what you'll see is it'll, there'll be high water marks. And then as the, the, the flood wave passes, the water begins to drop down. And because the, the, the uh, decline in the water surface is not going to be a, a perfectly smooth continuum, particularly if you've got a basin that's draining through uh, a very convoluted channel in order to get out, just like you would have here. If you look at this, I mean, if you look, look at, if you go down here to the uh, Bitterroot Valley, which is the southernmost distalmost reservoir for Lake Missoula, and then you look at the pathway that that water has to move to get out of the basin and up the Clark Fork, and then pass across the panhandle of Lake uh, of Idaho, where Lake Ponderé now is, 1,100 feet deep, and then come out and inundate the scab land. See, well, what's going to happen is water. For example, if you're in the in in the uh, right here, we're right there at the point of my uh, cursor is right roughly where Missoula is, and if you see this little. Let's see, it's one of these here that goes between Mount Sentinel and Mount Jumbo, the passageway. I forget which valley. It's maybe this one or this one. Anyways, you go to the, um, you see the two mountains there, and the strand lines are on both mountains. 
And I would say it probably, how long does it, would it take for 600 cubic miles of water to accumulate in here? Well, it depends on the rate of melting. But if you have a very rapid acceleration in the melting rate, you know, we might be looking at, you know, a couple of weeks or from somewhere in the range of days to weeks to back flood and fill the Missoula Basin to the 4,200 foot above sea level, right? Now, in this alternate scenario, at the same time that's happening, water is discharging over the north rim of the basalt plateau. I guess, I guess I'm just surprised that, because even, in, let's say like you're right, and it took two weeks to f of massive melting to fill up that, that basin that Glacial Lake Missoula is in. And then before it starts draining, maybe let's give it a couple of days, right? Because it gets to its very highest mark. Yep. And then uh, presumably it would begin to go down because it's also draining. Or do you think it would stay at that level for a while? You know, like it depends. It okay. See that question. Good question. But that all depends on the source of water. Right. Um, well, let's give it two weeks. Let's say it hits that high mark and it stays there for two weeks maximum. Right. The fact that it can make strand lines that would survive for 12,000 years is surprising. That's my only. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, especially if they're in rock. Yeah, you know that that's what that was, what I was wondering too. Is well, I don't think it's in rock. Okay, I I don't think it's they're not etched into bedrock. They're not, they're not cutting into. Rock. I think there's okay. a sedimentary cover there, but it's not very thick. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. That's that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'm still I think surprising gonna... that it lasts that long, but I guess you could find it if you were looking for it. You know, even if it's just traces of it. Yeah. Um, and there's also all kinds of debris and, you know, stuff floating at the edge. It's not just water at the top. So that yeah, stuff so is going to get settled along the sides too. See, now dirty, normally dirty if you've got a lake, <laughs> the strand lines are going to be produced by wave action that's being driven by wind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But in this case, I would say that the strand lines are actually produced because for one thing, like they're on Mount Sentinel, Mount Jumbo. In fact, we're going to zoom in on a map and I'm going to, jump over there and you're you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to reshare. All right. So you see here Mount Jumbo? Are we seeing this? Yep, yep, yep. we're seeing it. Okay, and over on the other side this is Mount Sentinel and here's University Mount. Okay, so or maybe the whole thing is called University Mountain. It's not that important. But let's back out Water of Lake Missoula backed up all the way into this valley here. Okay, so this, so way back up to wherever uh, for the the elevation of four thousand two hundred feet. To get to that, I would have to go to Google Earth, which I guess I could do here, um, and then we'll be able to actually see where that. Inter, where the line, which is the surface of the of the water, would intersect the terrain. So I'm going to zoom around, scroll on in. There's Idaho, Bozeman. Let's see. There's Missoula. Okay. All right. So here now we've got Mount Jumbo, East Missoula. So let, I'm hovering over. I'm hovering over the floor right here, um, and this is Mount Jumbo 40 at its maximum is about 45, 4,560 feet. Now I go down here to, Mon to, to the floor of the valley, I'm at 3,163. So that means at this point over here where it says Orchard Homes, these people that are living in this Orchard Homes, their houses would have been under 1,100 feet of water at its maximum. But now, see, what we can do is we can we can travel oh, right along 90 here. And as we're traveling, let's see, as I'm moving this direction, the floor of the valley is increasing. Let's see, right here at Clinton, I'm at 3,475 feet, Right. 3,470, and we're in, in the lake level is the high water mark is at 4,200. So let's see if I keep going along 90 here. There I'm at 3,552. So I'm still, still under the lake. 
here. Let's see. Uh, 3,600. So here, let's see at this Valley floor, 37. Damn. So this arm of the lake, here's 3,900. Yeah, Drummond, you're getting back there to the Flint Creek Valley where those uh, big field of melon yeah. are. So here is it. Four, we've just hit 4,000 feet. So at this point, right here, and I can zoom out to see where we are. At that point, the water is still 200 feet deep at its maximum. And if we that's keep a deep, that's a deep lake. <laughs> Shit, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 4,000, okay, here we are, right here. Okay, 4,100, here we are, right here. Oh, yeah, I see it. Oh. Yeah, so this this would have been like the temporary shoreline right in here. So if you were standing here under the alternate, I mean, of the orthodox view, this is a lake that forms over 50 to 100 years. So one would presume then, uh, or one would have to think about the source of water for the formation of that lake. Now, 600 plus cubic miles of water is a hell of a lot of water. So I think it's a fair question to ask, what was the source of that lake water if it was just, in fact, a lake? You know, if it's just a lake that takes 50 to 100 years to accumulate, then what's the source of that water? Is it rainfall, snowfall, snow melt? glacier melt some combination or what i would say that the answer to that question is totally relevant to understanding the whole flood process because it seems to me that there's a tendency now to just go okay the source of water was lake missoula and that explains it okay we're settled on an explanation now missoula just kept filling and emptying and filling and emptying and filling and emptying in, in, in cycles that were dozens and dozens of times, the ice had to recross the Purcell Trench. It had to extend as far down, presumably, as about Spokane. Because let's go back to the maps. And when we do that, see what I'm talking about here. Um, let's get the terrain on here. And now I, do I need to reshare? Are we nope. still looking at no, Google Earth? Good. No, we're looking at the maps. Oh, excellent. Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah. So now here's the thing. Okay. So the Purcell Trench lobe is the presumed lobe of ice that blocked the westward flow of the Clark Fork River, allowing the filling of the Lake Missoula Basin, right? That ice lobe came down the Purcell Trench. This is the Purcell Trench right here that I'm uh, describing with my cursor. It comes down. Here's Lake Pend Oreille, which at its deepest extent is about 1,100 feet, right? And then you come down here. Here's Spokane. So now... Right in here, that same 4,200-foot high water mark is etched into the side of the mountains, flanking the Clark Fork Valley, right? Well, that if, you, if you're assuming now the ice dam is there, then, and you, you know, ice is less dense than water, so you have to have, an, if, in other words, there's, the ice, if the ice is not as thick as the water is deep, the water is going to float the ice, right? So the how, how deep does the thick does the ice have to be then? Well, if the water, look, we can go right here to the floor of the Clark Fork River here, the valley. It's about 2,000 feet above sea level, roughly. Well, the high water mark, again, is 4,200 feet, so that's 2,200 feet, 2,100 feet. You know, of course, there, there's a lot of sediment along the the the, the valley bottom here if you took that sediment out you'd probably add another couple hundred feet to the depth of the valley but that's not important really for for my point here my point is that right in here somewhere and in generally the um in fact right here at cabinet gorge there's a dam cabinet gorge dam is right here and they have a uh, 
a sign basically saying that this is roughly where the glacial ice dam was retaining Lake Missoula. So here's my question. Now you've got 2,100 feet, say, of, of water depth here, right? Now, you've got an ice lobe that comes down here, and the ice lobe has to reach all the way down here to Spokane because if you look at typical ice marginal profiles, it's got to be over half a mile thick here. In other words, it's got to be at least 10% thicker than the, the water is deep, at least, right? So in other words, if the water is 2,100 feet here, you got to figure that the ice has to be at least another four, five, 600 feet thicker than that, or it, it ain't going to hold shit. It's going to float, right? So that being the case, you got to go, okay, how far does that ice need to extend down the Spokane Valley to be a half a mile thick right here? Well, it's got to go at least 30 miles to be a, a realistic marginal profile and not be artificially steepened in order to make this model work well then you got to ask how long does it take if if you have a flood that's going to be discharging 300 or 400 million cubic feet per second there's nothing below that outbreak point there's nothing left there's no ice dam there anymore it's gone completely so you could assume that if in that scenario the uh, the water bursts through here washes away the ice dam and the entire glacial lobe between Lake Ponderay and the end of the ice lobe at Spokane. But then, presumably north of there, filling the Purcell Trench, the ice, the glacial ice could still be intact, right? Well, okay, so, but now you have to go, okay, so if that water breaks out, washes this out, the lake basin drains, it's now empty. Now, how do you refill it? Well, you got to, presumably now the ice starts advancing again, right? Now, as it's advancing, we, we've got another sticky issue. At what point does the basin of Lake Ponderay come into the scenario? Now, if 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 Lake Ponderay is already there, well, you got to add another eleven hundred feet to the thickness of that ice sheet in order for it to completely fill the basin of Lake Ponderay. Right. That being the case. How long is, or, or is Lake Ponderay there? And then are we assuming that the ice sheet is now, uh, moving across the lake and, and so basically floating on the lake? I mean, because we can see that uh, there are ice shelves that float on bodies of water. So that would be one possible scenario. But if that's the case, then how do we, how do we prevent hydraulic connectivity between Lake, this arm of Lake Missoula and the water that would be under the ice lobe? You see, I, I don't see where any of these questions have been addressed. Yeah, if the ice is floating on the lake, then it wouldn't be a dam. It wouldn't work. Well, how could, yeah, how could it be? Yeah. I mean, how, there's no conceivable way that that could. And, and you know, if we're looking at 2,100 depth foot depth of water i mean figure it figure it out just use your straight formulas for uh pressure on a on a column of water you're going to get somewhere around 960 pounds per square inch that's a lot of pressure yeah now if that's the case if you've got ice you know that that can retain water at that pressure i mean uh, what kind of ice is that i mean look i think it would be very beneficial and informative if we spent a little time actually looking at glaciers, how they move, their structure, their architecture. And, you know, it doesn't take a, a, a very detailed investigation to realize that glacial ice is anything but a stable retaining uh, material. It's porous. It's fractured. There are moulins that, you know, when you have seasonal melting in the summer, you have water, pretty copious amounts of water that will pool on the surface of the tempered glaciers, right? Which would be the southern, and, and presumably here we've got it, it has to be a tempered glacier, right? How could it not be? I mean, you're in an environment where there's enough melting and rainfall and precipitation to accumulate 600 cubic miles of water in these basins right here. And we haven't even begun to talk about Lake Columbia yet, 
which is presumably lapping at the toe of the ice of the ice lobe down yeah, here by Spokane. That's really right. strange right there. Like you, you've got enough rainfall to fill that giant lake, yet the that tiny lobe is still there and rigid and not melting as well. It's a, that doesn't make sense. No, that's what I've been trying to get at for at least several decades now. And and if we throw Pond Array into the mix, you know, that just compounds it even more. You know, either Pond Array has to be not there or it has to be completely filled with ice, or it's a lake. Now, if it's a lake, you've got the Purcell Trench ice extending out, floating as an ice shelf over this lake. So how in the world is that going to sustain water at pressures of 900 PSI in excess? You know, And, and here's the thing, and we're going to do this. We are going to look at examples of modern glacial outburst floods. What we're going to find out when we look at modern examples, is it 100 to 200, in a few rare cases, maybe 300 feet of water against the ice dam? And that ice dam fails. It can fail usually by water forcing its way between the ice and the substrate or right through the ice itself. But my point that I was getting back to about seasonal melting on the surface of an ice sheet well, you can have considerable amount of water pooling on the surface of an ice sheet in a, in a tempered glacier during the summer. Well, what happens is you'll have a temporary body of water, and it's there, and then suddenly it disappears. And the reason it disappears is because at some point the volume of water gets enough, it finds a means of ingress into the ice, and then it's all over. It can quickly flow to the base of the ice sheet and then discharge. I mean, typically... You will see ice discharging 10, 20, 30 miles from its pooling to its point of discharge on the glacial snout within a matter of days, two weeks. In Iceland, when you have a volcanic eruption under that main ice sheet that now covers, uh, and if we go back out here, swoop over here to Iceland, you see there's Vatnajökull, I think is Basically, I say, there's a couple of volcanoes under this ice sheet right here, and they periodically go off, and they'll create a reservoir of meltwater that's contained under the ice sheet. Well, typically, and, and the one of the, the main poolings is about 30 miles back from the margin, and typically within a week to a couple of weeks, that reservoir has found its way to the snout of the glacier, discharges in a yokelops or an outburst flood, and then the reservoir drains until the next cycle of volcanic, volcanically supplied thermal energy melts another reservoir of water. In other words, it travels about 30 miles. Well, that's approximately the ballpark of the same distance it would have to travel from here, the area of Pond Array, to the Spokane Valley. So, what I'm doing is I'm just I'm I'm raising some questions about this whole phenomena that I don't think are being addressed. And to say then that there was a, a repeated damming of the lake, well, we just discussed, okay, if you have a flow that's going to create any one of the great scabland tracts, which could be Cheney Palouse, Telford, Grand Coulee, Moses Coulee. The discharge down the, the Columbia, which has been documented, which was a huge discharge, um, you know, along over here in the Big Bend region. Well, any one of those is going to require hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second. So then the assumption here, then the, the, it seems to me the, you know, uncritically proffered assumption here is that you have just the, the glacial dam washes away, the lake drains, the ice. Uh, readvances south and then begins to block the westward flow of the Clark Fork River again, and then you, it fills up another Lake Missoula. And then after it gets presumably a very substantially sized body of water, it breaks through the ice dam and it repeats this going back originally 40 times based upon the number of rhythmites in the uh, Burlingame game. Uh, gulch there um 
where the rhythmites are, the counting of those rhythmites, and then the assumption that each one of those was a separate flood, and then each of those separate floods required a separate filling of Lake Missoula, and each of those separate fillings of Lake Missoula required a separate damming of the uh, mouth of the Clark Fork in the region of Pend Oreille. Is that plausible? Under what circumstances could you have? And see, here, here again is the question. If you're talking about a, a, a lobe of ice that's advancing down, again, that ice has to be extremely stable. Because think about, think about the ice moving to refill the basin of Lake Pend Oreille. At the same time, you've got a vigorous river flowing through there. Well, what's going to win? The slow-moving ice or the vigorous water flowing in the river? I would think that the it'd be hands down, it's going to be the water. You know, as fast as that ice can be moving, the water flowing vigorously through there is going to be easily able to keep the, the, the passageway open. The assumption is that somehow this vigorous flow, and, I, and I've seen uh, the assumption made that the flow, the westward flow of this glacial river was double that of the modern Clark Fork. So if you've got doubled that flow, that's a pretty that's a pretty significant river flowing through there. So now you've got this situation where the ice lobe is advancing and it's meeting a vigorous flow of water discharging, discharging right through here. See, so now at some point you've got to assume then that that ice goes and the assumption is that the ice hits this mountain range here and it's able to fill the valley here and completely and perfectly seal the valley with such perfection that there's nothing that gets through. And it can't because, I mean, what we see from actual observations, empirical evidence of, of dam failures is, you know, all, it, all dam failures that are, that are uh, you know, the Teton Dam, same as the St. Francis Dam. You had a small leak that eventually became a big catastrophic leak. And that's always going to happen. That's why you got to plug the leaks. You know, if you've got a if you've got a concrete dam, you can't have leaks. You can't have water percolating through that dam in in a significant leak. I mean, when the Teton Dam failed, that was the first thing they noticed was that there was a leak, and it was a small leak. But then the 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 size and capacity of the conduit through which that water is leaking it expands exponentially. That's the point. So. My my problem here is how do we make this thing work? How do we bring this ice down and and repeatedly affect a perfect seal of, of of the Clark Fork Valley and do that over and over and over again in order to get somewhere between forty and ninety separate floods? Are you talking about ninety times that the ice? But see, and then now here's the thing. You're going to have a huge volume of water in excess of 600 cubic miles. Well, again, what I'm getting back to is what is what are the ratios? What are the proportions of uh, precipitation from uh, rain, uh, seasonal snow melt, uh, melting of the ice sheet? Well, now think about this: if it's melt, if the ice sheet is melting enough to contribute to the filling of these basins in a western montana to a thousand feet deep or more well what's going to happen to the ice i mean if the ice you know the water has to be con being converted from the ice into the melt water well that means the ice can't how, how do you have the ice extending expanding at the same time the water of melting ice is increasing you see what I'm saying? If, if you've got, if you melt enough ice that, that that ice is now filling Lake Missoula, 600 cubic miles of, of meltwater, well, what's happened to the ice? Isn't it, wouldn't it, would it not be receding? That's certainly one of the pressing questions. And, uh, one of the reasons I quit reading a couple of the books, because they would say that at the very beginning that the glaciers were advancing, but the lakes were also filling. Well, yeah. So it didn't seem to match up. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, at some point you're going to 
show these different sites. I, I imagine there's three or four or half a dozen probably where they're basing their idea of, well, there had to be 45 uh, or 90 floods and, and you can break down alternate explanations why those uh, multiple layers would be there and uh, perhaps show, show that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to match with the rest of the flooding story. Right. It was titanium ice. That's how it held in all the water. It was really strong. Uh, titanium. titanium ice. Yeah. That's my answer. Let's take a break. Okay. Look that one up. Sounds like a part of a new Marvel movie. Yeah, exactly. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And before we get into the subject matter, of course, we would like to mention CBD from the gods, and I think Randall has a new testimonial to share. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say that I'm, um, you know, still having great sleep, and uh, that's my personal testimonial. But this one came in, um, mm, let's see, pretty recently, within the last few days, I think. Um, doesn't matter, but it's, it's fairly recent and it's from Diona, Diona, Diona or Diona in Florida. And Diona says, folks, the CBD oil and salve package deal is the best way to give CBD from the gods a great trial at a wonderful price, internal and external application. Look, I have osteoarthritis psoriatic arthritis, and fibromyalgia, none of which can completely be relieved with prescription drugs, especially the generic not equivalents. These two products actually let me get hours of pain-free sleep and good restful sleep, as well as letting me be far more active in my life, something that I've had to compromise on as I'm getting older. Oh, they... Yeah, they are. They're getting older, too. I've noticed that happens to a lot of people. I've tried several other highly rated products, but this is hands down the best for noticeable. Noticeable. I think she forgot a word. Best for noticeable. Um, I would say effects is what she's trying to say. But she concludes by saying, I can't recommend it more highly. So that's great. That's great. I, you know, I'm just, I'm glad that it's helping people. Um, because it makes me glad that we're promoting it and I wouldn't be promoting it if, if I didn't feel like I was getting benefits out of it. Yep. Mike sent me some of the, uh, the gummies. Okay. And they're good. They, they taste good. Yeah. They're, uh, they are they're not as strong as the oil though. I like the oil for sleeping. So. Yeah. I, I, I prefer the oil too, but yeah, yeah we've got, you can see here, actually, I, I I ate a few episodes ago. I actually, on camera, ate one of the gummies. That's right, yeah. In fact, we had just opened it, and I took the top, the top gummy off, and now look. No gummies. <laughs> gummies all gone. <laughs> Go check them out. See these gummies. CBD from the gods.com enter the promo code RC ships free and you'll get free shipping. Thanks to everybody who has done that for us. Yeah. Yeah. And keep the testimonials coming. We, we yep. want to hear that. We do. We do get your note well, read on the show. <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's just pick up where we left off. Okay. So, um, I'm going to do, another share screen here all right this is just a, a nice graphic where we can see a lot of the Missoula basin and over here I'll, if you follow my cursor um Missoula is right in here right mount jumbo and mount sentinel is right here so it's clipped off a little bit of the of a lake uh, of a uh, a basin a channel a back channel to, of the lake. 
Sorry, Randall, you need to go south. Uh, yeah, right there. there this is. is, but it says Missoula. Okay, that's Lake Missoula. So there, sorry, thanks, Brad. So there's Mount Jumbo right there. Okay. This is the Bitterroot Valley down here, which would have been the most distal reservoir, the reservoir that's the farthest removed from the outburst point, which is up here. But I want you to take a look here at something. Notice that when you look at the water level, and this is presumably drawn at that 4,200 foot above sea level uh, surface, um, you'll notice that the water you see the see the, the 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 line here, the black line separating Montana from Idaho. That's the watershed divide. So, in other words, any rain falling to the west of this black line here is not going to go into Lake Missoula. It's going to uh -huh. go right. So, but any rainfall falling on the east side of this line would go contribute to Lake Missoula. But here's the thing. If you start looking at large lakes today, look at the, compare the size of the lake. Take any of the Great Lakes, for example, or any of the, you know, hey, Lake Ponderé, you know, Lake uh, Great Slave Lake, Great Bear Lake, uh, Lake Tahoe, you know, any of the, you know, any of the lakes that might be on the same scale as um, Lake Missoula and compare the size and area of the lake to the area of the catchment basin that's contributing or feeding that lake. Now, what happens is, is in the area removed from the body of water itself, you have a whole succession of streams and they have a very definite order, you know, the, the stream order. And basically, it starts with a first-order stream. And in a first-order stream, it's an ephemeral stream. It's like a first-order stream means there's nothing else feeding into it. Oftentimes, it's ephemeral in the sense that it's only flowing during rainfall or, you know, melt season or something like that. A second-order stream would would have one other stream flowing into it, right? Or you might have a convergence of two streams and whichever one is the dominant water flow or has the longest reach would become the first order and then the other one is the second order. And if you go through that way and you look at this branching network of streams and, and rivers in North America, for example, you'll actually have 12 orders, right? And this would be from the very smallest ephemeral stream up to the 12th order stream, which in North America, the largest uh, is the Mississippi River, right? So you think about the Mississippi has tributaries that have tributaries that have tributaries that have tributaries, all the way back to the first order stream. Got it? Well, here's the thing. Look at Lake Missoula. And essentially, you're talking about almost filling the entire catchment basin with water. You know, you see, in other words, look right over here in the Clark Fork Valley. You can see that the, that the arms of this lake are lapping right at the divide. Now, I don't think you can find anything comparable on the earth today. If you look at all of the, the big lakes around, they have large catchment basins feeding water because for one thing as the area of the water expands so does the rate of evaporation so at some point you have to have this balance between water loss through evaporation and water gained through rivers and streams flowing into the in, into the lake right well here again look at this this is my point is that how do you how do you get 600 cubic miles of water that's only being fed by first order streams which then forces us back to rethink about glacial melting but now if you're talking about all of this water is formed by glacial melt well what the implication is that okay well if you're going to say well all of these valleys were filled with ice at some point 
and then all that ice melted, yeah, okay, fine. But of course, now you have moved the margin of the ice sheet from somewhere down here in the Bitterroot Valley, hundreds of miles north. Uh, you, you begin to see the, the problem here? Okay, so if, if, if this is being fed by meltwater, where's it, it, you know, you got the flathead lobe here. You've got the, the Coot, West Kootenai Glacier here. You've got the Purcell Trench Lobe. But if, if you've got meltwater being fed into this basin, 600 cubic miles of it, well, how are you doing that without causing the ice to recede? And if it's receding, then how are you getting this advance of the per, down the Purcell Trench Lobe? How much of the ice area would work as a catchment basin? Like I presume it could, the ice can be rained on for, if it's real thick, it can be rained on for a long time before it completely eats it away. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it would work as a catchment bay. The water would run off the ice sheet and into there. That still doesn't explain it, but. You mean as if it was raining over the ice sheet yeah, up here? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And see, then that brings me to the other point, which is that if it's raining over the ice sheet, then clearly you're not looking at a polar climate. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and when you want to talk about glaciers that are solidly frozen to the substrate, you've got to go to a polar climate. Yeah. When you're, when you're in a temperate climate, you go to the bottom of the ice sheet and it's water. Yeah. There's basal water at the bottom of an ice sheet. And there's, there's literally, you know, flowing water under the ice sheet. I mean, you can go to any, any glacier, particularly in, you know, in the spring and summer. And you'll see water discharging from the snout, right? And that water is coming from up under the ice sheet. Now, are you going to say either either this 600 cubic miles of water is coming from the margin of the ice sheet? Well, if, it, if that means that you've got to melt 600 cubic miles of ice to produce 600 cubic miles of water, r roughly, in the ballpark, right? Or... The meltwater is not coming from the margin. It's coming from somewhere farther north. Or it's not meltwater at all. It's rainfall or snow melt. But you see the problem there. It's rainfall. Okay, so you've got copious rainfall over this. Well, what that mean in terms of the stability of, of the Purcell Trench Lobe to serve be, as a glacial dam? It would be the same problem because that rainfall would be eroding that, yes. that ice dam. And and. And it would have water beneath it already because it wouldn't be polar enough to be frozen all the way down to the ground. To, right. Yeah. So now here we look at this and here it's showing the Purcell trench lobe and coming down through here. Okay. So it's not coming very far. Right. And then you've got what's called Lake Columbia, which is pretty much like I said, lapping at the toe of the ice dam. So you've got, a thousand feet, I mean two thousand feet elevation change between the bottom of this ice dam and the top of the ice dam. Wow. Think about the hydraulic head that's created there. That's an extraordinary amount of potential energy blocked up behind this ice limb right here. And you see how here they're bringing the ice lobe pretty much terminating it right at the state line. That's right there by that Cabinet Gorge Dam. So now the alternative is, is this, this is all a, a very large pulse of meltwater flowing south off of the southern sector of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. And that is what's producing not only Glacial Lake Missoula, but also what is being called Lake Columbia. So it's flooding Lake Columbia and Missoula at the same time, and the what what the what is the ice dam is just a temporary just a restriction. obstruction, just a temporary obstruction. Well, it's yeah, but even after the ice is gone, it's just a restriction from the flow out of Missoula to the west, right? The, but here's the thing: there are, and Brad and I have visited several of these white pine gravel pit, dry creek gravel pit. There are extensive uh, valley trains extending to the southeast off of these, um, you know, these uh, peninsulas here reaching out into the lake, right? And their four sets dip to the southeast. And they have lithologies, they have rocks in there in the deposits whose source is the Purcell Trench. 
That so the that implies oh, wow. the water is flowing very quickly in that direction. Is that what you're in saying? that direction? Yeah. Yes, flowing quickly to the southeast, carrying that stuff. Yes, and dropping it in the lee of those peninsulas. Yeah. Okay. In fact, oh, wow. at this point, we could wow. even take a look. Let's Which look is, at yeah, some. That's that's wrong because if it's taking the lake a lo- hundred years to fill up and then it's supposed to flow out quickly after the ice dam, that stuff should be going in the other direction. That's right. Okay. That's right. That would be the simplest explanation. Um, I'm going to show Mount. Uh, that's what I give. Simple explanations. <laughs> okay. Are we still seeing this? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here's strand lines. Now, one interpretation in the orthodoxy is that each one of these strand lines represents a separate lake. So in other words, the, the attempt is to correlate the strand line with the filling of the lake. And the that's, idea then is each time the lake fills, it's a little bit lower than the preceding one. And that's how you create the succession of shorelines. It's completely unnecessary, though. I mean, all is those it, strand lines could be made from one lake. One lake draining, yeah. Draining. One lake draining. Well, let's go to, let's look at some stuff here. Here you go. Lake Como, Western Montana. Strand lines formed as lake level dropped during a summer drought. So this was over one summer, the lake level dropped. You can see the high shoreline here and look at, look at the strand lines. These were not formed by separate fillings of the lake. They were formed by a receding lake, by one lake receding. Now, in this case, because it's an actual lake, the, the strand lines are going to be formed primarily by wave action. If we go back to here, these strand lines are most likely formed because the water is actually moving. It's a slow-moving river, but also, of course, with wave action. But the point is, is that the draining of the body of water that's in here is not a smooth, uniform process. It's more pulsed. And the reason it's pulsed is because if you go back and you look at the, you know, the map here of how this lake is supposed to drain, okay, hopefully you can still see this. There's a map of the lake itself. Okay, now look at, here's the Bitterroot Valley. Now think about the water that's in Bitterroot Valley. In order to get out up here, look at, look at the torturous route it has to follow. It has to go through a whole succession of bends and constrictions every one of which is going to retard the advance of that water. If you have a 180-degree bend, you see what happens there is that that serves just as, as friction. Now, imagine that you've got this as full pool, 4,200 feet above sea level, and we're 2,100 feet deep here at the interface with the ice dam. Now, let's just think through this. The ice dam gives way, right? Well, you're going to have this 2,000-foot hydraulic head right here at the state line, and that is going to immediately collapse and rush out catastrophically. Now, I don't know if you can – can you see my thumbnail? Is my thumbnail visible where you can see me? Yeah. Yeah, we can see you. If you can see my hand, let's let's just make an idealized vertical. Let's say here's ice sheet and here's here's the water. The ice sheet goes away, so the water immediately – collapses. It just begins to collapse. And what you have is that the, let's go from this side, the angle of the water as, as it's draining out is shallowing. It's do, it immediate, Initially, let's say we can instantaneously remove the, the obstruction. So now the water does this. It goes out like that. And then the water surface, as it goes out like this, the water surface begins to, to decline. So Imagine that you're sitting in an inner tube floating in the water down here. Now, this is assuming this is a a static lake. What are you going to experience when this gives way up here? Well, if you were sitting right here behind the ice dam, whoa, you're going to have a hell of a ride. I mean, you're going to have a big rush as that water rushes out. But what are you going to experience sitting floating down here? Well, the first thing is you're going to see that there's a gentle current moving you north and as the water drains the lower it gets the less hydraulic head and the less energy it has right so in other words initially you're going to have this big outrush of water but as the volume diminishes and the the hydraulic head declines 
the energy gets lower and lower, and the final draining of the lake is going to be a rather protracted, slow, gentle affair. Just It makes sense, doesn't it, if you think about it? So what's going to happen? You're sitting in your inner tube here. Chances are you're going to find yourself coming to ground somewhere between here and the outlet. You're going to just be sitting there in the mud, and there's no more water to carry you along, right? Now, if there's a lake, this is a lake, right? This, this, what, what should you find on the bottom of this lake? If let's say there's, you know, if, if there's 50, 40 or 50 Missoula lakes here over a period of 3,000 years, should you not find thick packages of lacustrine sediment yeah. with whatever types of uh, mollusks or fish remains or vegetation yeah, or whatever would have been living in that lake? Because yeah, for one thing, leaves here, and stuff from the annual cycles from fall and all that. All of that packed right? in there. Now, up here where the water's rushing out, you can assume that there's going to be enough force that the water is flushing anything like that that's there. But when you're, you know, look here, look, when you go back up again, here's, here's Missoula. If you go all, this is that valley we traced. If you go all the way back up here to where it's 4,200 feet above sea level, how fast is this going to drain? Well, you're initially, you're probably going to even hardly notice it because all of this, all of this has to drain out first. Otherwise you've got hydraulic damming, right? So the question then is, what do you find on the floor, of, say, of Bitterroot Valley? Well, Brad and I have traversed Bitterroot Valley and visited a number of quarries where you can see what the valley floor is composed of. And guess what? It's not typical lacustrine deposits. In fact, far from it. All right, so we left off with this. And I'm showing how there's strand lines that were created by a single lake and a single, um, you know, draining of that lake, or not draining, but in this case, it's going to be evaporation. But the water moving against the shoreline leaves the strand lines. The point being, we're not, these, each of these lines here does not represent a separate emptying and then subsequent refilling of the lake. That's my point. Okay. Um, so let me say for a minute there, we, we did talk about that many episodes ago and I, I looked it up a little bit to try to find out what was perhaps going on with that lake. And it does seem that they do releases to assist the irrigation in the Bitterroot Valley. So that could have been a sequence of releases over that summer during the drought. Okay, and but but again, that again supports my point. Is that you say it's, it's a release? Still a single draining, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not not refilling and leaving another mark. Correct. I think right. that uh, if it refilled, it would erase any lower marks, right? So each refilling would have to be below the one above it, or else it would erase it for the most. Presumably, part. yes. Yeah, yeah. I think we got into that with Jerome at some point. Um, so there, there are arguments that it would not erase it, but, but yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, the, yeah, the, 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 the deeper they're etched, the longer it would take for it to erase them for sure. I think that's why I was asking like how, how, how deeply were they etched for it to, for them to last 12,000 years, you know, like those, I bet those strand lines that Randall was showing us are not going to last that long, even if that thing never fills back up with water. They'll be gone in 10,000 years. Oh, in Lake Como? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's all a matter of scale. Right. Yeah, it's all a matter of scale. Okay, well, we'll come. We'll so, come yeah, we'll you were going to the, the, the quarries down there in the Bitterroot Valley. Is that what you're looking for? I was going to, yeah. Um, let's see. That was... Uh, do you remember what year we went to those? Um, that was 07 because it was Rusty and my dad. Ah, yeah. Okay, right. 07. Okay. So uh, here we go. Here we go. 
Okay, let me show you what we find. Now that stuff looks familiar. But I, it's not lacustrine sediment. No, but it looks like the just like, looks like in the Texas. Stuff we have. Yes, looks yeah. like what we have here. Yeah. Okay, this is what the entire valley floor is composed of. Wow. Hmm. Where are the where are the laminated silts that it are typical lake, on the lake, lake bottom? <laughs> Look at this. This this is the valley floor here. That is a deposit that I would say resulted from directly from turbulent suspension. Look at this. Where are the lake deposits? Look at the look at the texture here. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't look like lake lake deposits. Lots of sharp corners on those rocks too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They yes. didn't even travel very far. Didn't travel far. Ripped up, let's see here. Um I think we got let's see, go back. Yeah, here's a bar of that stuff pointed into the bitter root from the north. Let's see. All right. Even all the way down in the bitter root, huh? Yeah. There's Here is of it. this wow. is at the northern end. And this is actually, I don't know if you can see it too well from here, but there there's there's a there's a dip. This is dipping yeah. to the south. Yeah. And that southerly dip is consistent with a rush of water into the lake basin, into the Bitterroot Valley from the north. This is not a typical lake deposit. Yeah, it looks like a river deposit. Yeah, totally. It looks like a river deposit. In fact, it looks like a vigorous river deposit. Yeah. yeah. A river probably swollen in floods. Because typically a river will stabilize. I mean, you've got some pretty sizable clasts in here. Look at the size of this stuff. This is this is a significant flow right here that's in training all of this stuff. And it looks to me like it's not a succession of events. But pulses of more and less vigorous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is why it drops big boulders in some areas and then smaller rocks above those. And Right. Yeah. But it's still all the same event. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the Bitterroot Valley here. Okay, so let's let's go now to the north end. We'll go to the Flathead Lake region. Um Okay, Flathead Valley. Here's Mission Valley. Missoula's down here. So all of these areas, all of these basins in here were submerged. Uh, the elevation right here, just south of Flathead Lake, is right about a 3,000, 3,100 feet above sea level. So the water depth here was 1,000, 1,100 feet deep right in here at, at full pool, 4,200 feet above sea level. There was ice filling the Flathead Lake Valley. Let's see if we can look at this satellite view. This is called the Big Arm, and this is um, uh, big, big Arm. Draw. This is Big Draw. Big Draw is in here. Let's see. This is Big big Draw is this right in here, right? This east-west passageway. The glacier snout came in, and we can actually see where the glacier terminated because there's a there's an arcuate mound of of uh, terminal mooring right here, and glacier filled this, and then it came down here, and this is moraine in here. In fact, this is the Polson moraine, named after the little town of Polson, right? This right on the uh, shore of the Flathead Lake. So when we do a follow up. Um, floodlands tour. At some point, we need to go into into the lake basin itself, because where we're going to be, uh, you know, next week is only going to be in the Channel Scablands, because we're only going to have 
time enough, five days, we're, we're going to only, we're not going to have time to get into the, to the whole landscape. So we could, we could get to the flathead area in the Missoula part of the tour or we have to do another one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Which we should, we should do a follow-up because otherwise you don't have the whole picture. Right. Now, if we want to do two weeks, yeah, then we could take in the whole, the scab lands and the, the lake. I'm using the term lake, but the lake basin. Yeah. Well, I think so, we're, we're going to do a part two that does the Missoula area, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what it looks like is that you had a major discharge off of the flathead lobe. And we can get into that some. Uh, we'll look at the discharge that came off of this um, uh, big arm. Uh, right here. Um, That's the Elmo Moraine. Elmo Moraine. Thank you. The Elmo Moraine. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. This little graphic is to try to show you the configuration of the ice sheet. Look down here. You'll see how the ice filled and you'll see this Moraine Ridge right here, right there that was at the snout. And you'll look at the Elmo Moraine was this right here. So there's Moraine here, here. And then the ice crept back up this way. Now, Right here in the elbow or, you know, armpit of these glaciers is where uh, Chief Cliff is. Now, Chief Cliff is a very interesting feature because it also doesn't have a logical explanation within the conventional scenario. Because in the conventional scenario, again, the idea here is that this water is going to have a rather protracted drawdown. It's not going to be a violent rush out, right? Like it's going to be up in the mouth of the Clark Fork. Because again, this water has to go through a whole bunch of turns and twists and constrictions. All of these things are going to impede the efficient outflow of the water. And it's, and, and then if you think about the fact that there's evidence at least below the ice dam that there were thousands of huge icebergs being carried along in the flood water. Well, think about any northern river. We used to go out and when we were kids to watch the ice break up in the spring. And typically what would happen is the ice on the rivers would break up and you have these big chunks. And then, you know, they might be floating downstream, but then there gets to be a tight bend in the river. And then you get a, a jam. Same way with logs. You get a log jam, right? Or... What used to cause a lot of problems was if you had the broken ice chunks jamming around uh, bridge abutments, right? So they would literally sometimes go in there with dynamite to blow up the the iceberg or the, the broken chunks of ice that are jamming into the constrictions within the river or in the bends or around abutments or things like that, see? Well, you got a picture now. This water has to be carried from western Montana all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Think of, and, and, and you, when you begin to think about the details and the specifics of that journey, you realize that, hey, this isn't like, boom, you open the floodgates and gush, it's right there into the ocean. Uh-uh. It's a long, torturous trip it has to make, right? And it's carrying sediment of all kinds and degrees. It's carrying thousands of large icebergs. So what do you think is going to happen when you get a constriction, like when all of those water flows converge at Wallula Gap, right? So anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to follow, we're going to come up here and we're going to follow because what I'm going to show you here is evidence that you had a major rush of water following the margin of this ice lobe right here that flowed down this way and right through here between the ice and the mountain or the hill and down this way, and that there was another flow that either came from below the ice or on top of it that breached the Elmo Moraine right here. And then here's the southern part of this Mission Basin. I'm going to call your attention to Camas Prairie right here. And uh, the Highway 3, whatever it is that comes down here that goes through this Marco Pass, it's called right here, um, is a range of east-west east oriented hills that stood as an obstacle to this onrush of meltwater from the north. Um, 
so yeah, this just identifies the various places. This is this is the the this would have been the lake bottom, which that's uh, this area right in here. The mountain range that you see over here is this one. And this shows the pathways out of this particular basin. Um, the highest elevation was Rainbow or Lake Pass right here, which served as a temporary outlet until the water level dropped below the elevation of the pass. And water came down here, and it hit this range of hills and then had to rush over the hills. And it undoubtedly was uh, highly energetic and tremendous shear forces because a lot of sediment was washed from this hills and spread out on Camas Prairie, the floor of Camas Prairie Basin. Um, other outflows were through here and here or about down by the National Bison Range. This is, picture is taken looking north into Flathead Lake from atop the Polson Moraine. And you can see here it's actually a couple of hundred feet above the, the valley floor. Uh, let's keep going. This, this you can see here, the thick layer of sediment that accumulated just south of the ice sheet. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, during the last great glacial advance, the Flathead Glacier moved down the Rocky Mountain Trench, depositing the Polson Moraine at the south end of Flathead Lake and various smaller moraines in the Big Arm Embayment. Near the middle of the lake, the southward-moving Flathead Ice split into two parts. One lobe continued south into Polson Bay. The other turned to the west and moved into the Big Arm Embayment. The Big Arm Ice split again into three sublobes, these, in turn, pushed into the Dayton, Big Draw, and Big Arm Valleys. The three sublobes deposited terminal moraines in each valley, moraines which are believed to be of the same age as the Polson Moraine. So if we go back here to this, right here, to my graphic, here's the three sublobes, each that had their own moraine, and here's where we're saying where the ice split right here, right? So that what what we just talked about was des describing this configuration right here. All right, so look at this. Okay, here's the two two sublobes. This is the um, the this is this is the Elmo. This this one was the uh, Dayton uh, Valley. Dayton. What I want you to notice here is that what I'm featured that we're about to see is Chief Cliff, which is right here. Now, if you look at this right here, you're going to see a scour trough, and there's two lakes there. Those lakes were uh, in basins that were essentially scoured out by a vigorous flow of water that was running right down here along the edge of this glacier lobe. I called your attention to that right here along this margin right here is where that trough is where those two lakes are. And then because of the existence of this Elmo lobe, the water was diverted to the west. So then we can go back here and get the picture. Right in here is the trough between the hills and the ice lobe. You can very clearly see the moraine. You can see where it was breached right here. This is a breach point. And the, and the modern roadway goes through that breach. And then you have the whole... Uh, Big draw, which is just off the screen here. We'll see it in a minute. The whole valley is floored with this thick layer of sediment that makes a flat floor that filled the previous existing V-shaped valley. Now, you can follow. Here's Look, here, right here, you can follow a pathway for discharging water right like this. Comes down this way and right out here. Uh, the chief cliff topography originates near the big meadow in Dayton Valley and continues around the eastward-facing slopes of Hog Heaven Range. Alden, in 1953, believed that the waters impounded behind the Dayton Ice Lobe escaped between the glacier and the mountain slope. 
Thus, a temporary spillway was eroded at the base of Chief Cliff and produced what Flint, in 1957, terms glacier margin channels. And there's Chief Cliff, and here is the channel. You can see the profile of the channel. Now, what happened was this is the water flowing around this cliff, and it's flowing be between the hills and the ice sheet. So this is the Flint's ice marginal channel. Now, the cliff itself is about 500 feet high. And when we look here, here's an example from a modern glacier, but it's, it would have been similar. In other words, here's the hills or the mountains, and here's the ice sheet. And this trough in between the two serves as a conduit for meltwater, whether it's typical normal amounts of meltwater or some type of a catastrophic flow, obviously it's going to exploit the trough, right? And so I put a little graphic in here kind of to show a cross section of a major discharge through, through this ice marginal situation here. And then the over deepening of it. So it's going to erode not only the hill, but also the glacier. And if we look here, there you can see the trough. See it? And so I'm going to do a very crude, very crude pre-flood, pre-glacier profile. All right? Okay. Then we're going to put in the glacier, the Elmo sublobe. So you can see here, there's the glacier. And then there's a huge meltwater flow through here. And then when the meltwater flow is gone, it leaves this telltale trough right here. So this, this is the remnant of the channel, the ice marginal channel that carried this large conveyance of meltwater. That meltwater wrapped around, because remember now the the, the Elmo sublobe is coming up here. And in fact, down here is a, is a gravel quarry. There's a, there's, a, there's a very active gravel quarry right down here that's quarrying all the gravel that was left in the lee side of this cliff. And undoubtedly, all of this piles of gravel here, which is what all this is, was ripped out uh, in the creation of this trough. Randall, I've got a pretty decent uh, drone image of that, including the quarry there, if you want to see it. If looking you got it handy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just found it. Uh, Chief Cliff's kind of in shadow, but you're looking over that quarry and the big arm and then and then down the big draw. Okay, let's let's look. All right, let's see if I can do that quickly here. But yeah, you you won't be able to use your cursor on it. Okay, so we're looking oh, to the yeah, west. That. Wow. That's that's west, yeah. Yeah, so you could so point Chief out. Cliff here. Uh, yeah, there's the cliff, and you can see the gravel quarry down there. Right down here. Yep. And so, yeah. And you can see, look at the wash at the base of the cliff there. The, the coarse, yeah, gravelly, it. bouldery wash. So, yeah, I made several flights that day, so I... I Flew from down here, uh, from atop the moraine down there, and then that little channel that we drove off of, into up mm -hmm. this way. Yeah, I made several flights. Um, so yeah, just stills going around here. So then that's the oh yeah Black Lake or Blue Lake going over into Dayton Valley there. Right. That's so that would have been yeah, that would have been the bottom of that temporary meltwater channel there. That's that scoured and you see a lot of these scour whole lakes in the path of turbulent floodwaters. But see, here's the point. This is water. The water that did this is coming from the north into a distal reservoir of the lake. See, I would argue that what we're looking right here is consistent with the idea that there was a, 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 an accelerated melting to the north. And that's where this water came from. And not 50 or 100 years of rainfall and snow melt. Yeah, because when you look at the the maps of where the glacier, the glacier ice was and the lobes of it, it doesn't seem like it has any uh, any other place it could come from except for the ice. 
Yeah. Right. There's no other possible source. It doesn't seem like not to be able to scour that stuff out. If it was a slow filling, it wouldn't have done all that scouring. Right. Right. The same, and this is from the glacial geology. This is by um, Daryl Smith. Oh, okay. We met him on one of our field trips, didn't we, Brad? Uh, I don't recall. University yeah, of Montana. Yeah, we did. Right. We did. This was glacial geology of the Big Arm region of Flathead Lake in the glacial geology of Flathead Valley and catastrophic drainage of glacial Lake Missoula. Field guide number four. Randall Carlson says, according to the prevailing explanation for the origin of the Missoula flood, a lobe of glacial ice served as a temporary dam against the westward flow of the Clark Fork River out of western Montana. The damming of the valley of the Clark Fork is assumed to have occurred somewhere in the vicinity of the Montana-Idaho border, very near the location of the present-day Cabinet Gorge Dam and Overlook. It is presumed that the ice was sufficiently resistant to failure so as Excuse me, to be able to impound water to a depth of 2,100 feet at the ice dam lake water interface. In this model, upon rupture of the ice dam, the lake, which was being held back, began to drain. It must be realized that the principal reservoirs forming the bulk of the lake water volume were removed from the point of discharge by distances varying from about 100 to well over 200 miles. For example, the distance by river from the Idaho-Montana state line to the entrance point into the Mission Valley, which was the largest of the various basins forming Lake Missoula, is over 110 miles. The distance by river from the same area to the town of Missoula, which now occupies a site that would have been nearly 1,000 feet underwater, is nearly 175 miles. It has been acknowledged that there would be a considerable lag time between ice dam failure and the complete draining of the distal basins. Yet no studies have been performed which really address this issue. It is assumed that the draining of Lake Missoula was rapid. The reality of megascale rapidly moving currents is certainly confirmed by the full suite of geomorphic evidence found throughout the entire region of the presumed lake. Most prominently, would have to be the great current ripple fields found in Camas Prairie Basin. How can anyone doubt that these features were anything but the product of an extraordinary, almost unbelievable hydrological event? Yet certain features of this current ripple field are inconsistent with the prevailing dogma of rapid draining. First of all, the size of the individual ripples diminishes from north to south. The entire complex of giant ripples is roughly five miles, from just south of or below Marco Pass to the point at which they disappear. At the north end, some of the largest ripples have an amplitude of 40 feet and a chord of some 200 feet. In addition, the clast size, that is the size of aggregate rock composing the internal structure of the ripple, diminishes from north to south. Both of these conditions are consistent with a current that is flowing from the north and decreasing in stream power towards the south. So See, the camas, ripples were made yeah. by the filling of the lake. What? The ripples were made by the filling? By the filling of the lake. That's exactly my point. By the catastrophic filling of the lake. That's cool. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's really good. Cool. Hey, that's badass. Kyle. You have earned enough points to last you probably through several upcoming episodes. All right. Hey. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, you, you nailed it. That's exactly what I was getting at. Camas Prairie Basin empties to the south through the valley of Camas Creek, a tributary of the Flathead Lake. At the southern outlet of the basin, the elevation is about 2,800 feet. From this point along Camas Creek to its junction with the Flathead River is about five miles, over which the grade drops about 335 feet. As the lake drained, this outlet imposed a flow constriction upon the water attempting to exit the basin via the Flathead River. Acting as a venturi flume, this constriction would have induced a flow acceleration as the waters drained. 
A current flow draining Lake Missoula would have flowed with increasing power as it approached the southern basin outlet, passing into and through the constriction. Yet what we see is a current entering the basin from the north and decelerating to the south. In other words, the ripple fields were built by water flowing into the basin, not out of, that is, not by water flows emptying Lake Missoula, but by water flows filling it, which is exactly what you just said, Kyle. And so when we go down, big draw. So this is just ignored or have, you know, have mainstream geologists acknowledge this, this problem with the ripples and the. Not really. No, I haven't seen wow. that acknowledged. So Derard Smith, Der Derard Smith goes on to say, deep accumulations of gravel outwash on the floor of the big draw indicate that an immense volume of sediment choked meltwater once discharged down the big draw. The big draw outwash varying from one half to one mile across extends westward for eight miles from the Elmo Mooring. And here we are looking down, looking west along Big Draw, and you can see how you've got this flat floor of sediment that fills the original yeah. V-shaped valley. Wow. So there's a massive amount of sediment filling it. So the water, as we're looking at this scene, the water was flowing away from us. And then as it gets down here against these mountains, it turns to the left or to the south. And so here's the map. You can see here's the Elmo Moraine. Here's the breach point. The, the road right here goes through that breach point, which is obvious why, you know, it's right. But here you have the trough where the water drain that came and created those scour hole lakes and cut Chief Cliff right here. So That's all that happening. flowed down here. That must have been happening first, right? It's. I would think first. Yeah, and then the breach happens second. Right. I think the breach did. My question is: Was the breach caused by a subglacial flow or a supraglacial flow? Mm. But the water flow followed the road right down here, and then it turned south. Almost did a right angle turn south. And Are there, there we drumlins go. Underneath the ice area there. What's that? Are there any drumlins in the, within the ice, like behind the moraine? You know, no, the, but you can moraine. find drumlins as soon as you get to the north of Flathead Lake. Okay. So look at, look at this undulating hills right here, right? You can almost see, look, look at the flow of water. There we go. And then you can see on the flat valley floor, there are all kinds of the scarring of the residual flows. And check this out. Look at on the hills. What do you see on the hillsides? Strand lines. Strand lines yeah. And this is, this is strand lines for moving water. Now, are we going to argue that each of these strand lines represents a separate flood? Or are we going to say that the that these hills were submerged and then the water drained off? We're looking at looking south here. Down here is that low range of hills where that were breached. So you got a picture of this onrush of water to the south filling this valley, and then it hits these hills down here and then washes over the hills. Um, that's down here. There's the hills. And then just south of the hills is Camas Prairie Basin. So as we're flying over the ground, you can see what the ground topography looks like after the passage of these highly um, turbulent floodwaters. So here's Camas Prairie. You see the hills. The highway comes through the Marco Pass. There's a pull-off right here, which is a great place to stop in order to view the, the great ripple train that extends five miles to the south. This shows the movement of the floodwaters. Here's the Rainbow Lake Pass. So this was the highest of the channels that carried water out of this particular basin here. 
and you can see there's a scoured lake basin right there. And you see that there's two converging pathways. And then there was an outlet on the south end of Camas Prairie. So just to give you an idea, this is current rippled sand deposit on the floodplain of South Fork Peachtree Creek after Hurricane Ivan flooding. The floodplain is now occupied by Medlock Park. It had been decades since any flood had overtopped the modern banks of the creek. So I went out there, and here was this fresh sand deposit with the ripples in it. Now, over, I don't know if I've got it here, but you could easily figure out how deep the water was because it left marks on the buildings and trees and so forth, high water marks. But you can see the size and amplitude. The, the cord length is like one, two, say th roughly three inches. The amplitude is about an inch, right? Now we're looking across giant current ripples. There's a farmhouse right here. So we'll go through a few of these. Let's see. Here we go. So we're looking north. Here, here's a huge delta that was formed by the water rushing over the hills. And all of this is sediment to the south of that range of hills. And here is a scoured low area in the range of hills. And look at the whole landscape. Here we are looking north, and here's the Great Ripple Train, and here's the Great Fan Delta. So this is from water being, I mean, sediment being uh, pulled off of this range of hills into, into this basin as it's filling. Because for temporarily, Camas Prairie was like a giant bathtub, and it filled up with water. Yeah, there we go. You can see there's another scour trough lake. And then here's that fan delta right here. And notice that there's giant ripples on the surface of that delta. This is quite phenomenal. And I mean, you can look here, you can get the sense of the scale. You know, here's the various buildings and roads. It's almost like a big uh, initial wave that came off the ice and pushed through that area, yeah. you know, just, just busted through that ridge and ended up creating that fan as, and then continued building it. Yes. And that's just grassland? All that is just, is it yeah. grassy? Yeah. Well, you'll see here, you know, here we are looking down on the big fan delta, and some of the biggest ripples are right on its surface. It's just the Wills Creek yeah. Deltaic Bar, State Route 382, yeah, 382 is visible across the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Well, this is what the ripples are composed of. So you're not going to grow a lot in that stuff. Okay, yeah. Okay, now I don't think anybody's going to argue that this deposit wasn't the result of turbulent suspension, just being stuff being dropped. Well, compare this to the stuff that was on the floor of Bitterroot Valley. It's not that different. Right. It shows a chaotic mass of stuff that was just dumped massively. We're looking across. We're looking to the west here, um, across the northern end of Camas Prairie. And here's the great delta fan. And you see how it's splayed out from the hills? And in fact, you can see the splaying, how material was just washed from these hills down. And that's what's created the, the huge ripple train and the deltas. And right over here in the distance, you see this trough? That's Rainbow Lake Pass. So again, that's the highest channel discharge point um, from Camas Prairie Basin. And it's occupied by what's called Rainbow Lake and Dog Lake, is I think the local term, but it's a scour trough lake. And here it is from the air. And so the flow is from right to left. And here I'm putting in the 4,200 foot uh, line above sea level. So this is how deep the water was through here.
So let's see, we can look here, notice here that the entire valley floor is almost level from north to south, 22,835 feet above sea level. And then it suddenly steepens right here and drops down by 400 feet roughly from this point to this point. So this is where the flow acceleration would have occurred, you see. Now, think of this. Let me do this. 4,200 feet above sea level minus 2835 means that the water here at its maximum was 1,365 feet deep. Pretty amazing, huh? Deeper than you see current pond array. What? Deeper than current pond array. Yeah. How, which how is really long, deep. How long is that area from, you know, your red circle there to the other red circle where it's 385 down to... Each the of these squares is one mile. Okay, so... so look here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six miles. Yeah, and then the next set, one, two, three, four, what is it, five to that one? One, two, three, meh, four. Four. four and a half. So it has to drop. It has to drop four hundred feet in in four miles there. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, that would have been moving pretty quick. Yeah, it would have been moving quick down there. Yeah, and then once it gets down there, it has to flow this way to try to get out of here to get out of this basin. And there's the National Bison Range, which is right. Uh, no, I guess it's not quite, you can't quite see it here. But again, strand lines. More strand lines on the flank of Bitterroot Valley. Okay, so we'll pause there. Excellent stuff. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by the ripples and... That was cool. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you, I think. I think it, it more work needs to be done to see if we can tie all these events together and see if they're all happening within yeah. a short span of time. Yeah. You know. Well, we'll just keep looking at the evidence and wherever the evidence leads us. Yeah. But I'll just, you know, as I've said, I, I have a hard time with this idea of 40 to 90 glacial dams and repeated filling of the basin and emptying of the basin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Touch, and, touch. and I've seen now chronologies supposedly um, explaining the succession. And of course, all of the scab land tracks are not being created simultaneously in that, in the conventional scenario. They're all being created sequentially over a period of three or 4,000 years. Or I've even seen now. The most recent dating for the earliest flood is around 18,000 years ago. So we, that we need to look at that because I've got studies here showing that it's likely that the Cordillera and Aishi didn't even reach its full southerly extent until between 16 and 17,000 years ago. Ah, hmm. So there's a major contradiction right there. Yeah. Hmm. So... I think that in order to comprehend what's going on here, we have to look at this in the context of the whole episode of glacial melting. We have to look at the whole melting process of the entire North American glacial complex. And unless we do that, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to understand what happened there. Yeah. And that's not to say there was only one big flood. But however, I would go back and go, okay, well, let's have studies of Camas Prairie that, you know, how many floods left their mark in Camas Prairie? Is that multiple floods that created that ripple train? I don't know. But if there were multiple floods through there, shouldn't we see clear evidence of multiple floods? Yeah, the succession I, of lake bottoms? Yeah. And why the huge ripple train there again? And that would have so, had to have been the last one, right? Because, you know... The, well, it would have had to have been the last one. Yeah. Like any previous ripple trains would be erased by a success, uh, like a, a ne another flood unless it wasn't strong enough to do it. And then you should still see evidence of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and then if, as, as you diminish in energy, then 
you should be finding more evidence of, you know, a low energy depositional environment like you would yeah. find in a lake. That's right. I bet you could go to Lake Como there if they were draining it and drawing it down and you could do core samples from the bottom of the lake and you would find typical lake bottom sediments. Not the kind of broken, coarse, gravelly, massive deposits like I was just showing you are exposed on the floor of Bitterroot Valley. That seems like a good idea for a, a way to date some of the flooding would be a, a, a residual lake. Right, it's left over from that event. Yeah, and then go and count the layers in the lake core sediments. Well, I think that's what we're seeing at Nine Mile Creek. So we can pick that up next episode. All right, all right, sounds good. Good all stuff, right. man. Kronos Appreciate has it. Hat on. Time to end the show. Lots of territory, but yep, yep. Only so much time. That's Only right. so much time. Yep. Another great one, though. Yeah. Well, see us Brad. on how to sign up for the newsletter at RandallCarlson.com. Yeah, we go. got a new newsletter coming out with some pretty good stuff in it. Juicy stuff about the footprints in New Mexico. What uh -huh. an interesting story that is. Yes. So, yeah, the new newsletter will be going out uh, by this weekend. and First weekend some, of the month. Yeah, it's got some some good stuff in it. All okay, right, well, guys. Mike hasn't had a lot to say tonight, but yeah, no, I had some I had some questions. I just never found a time to to interrupt you uh, and 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 sidetrack you. But I've, I'll save them for next week. I, you know, questions about looking at the volume of water in Lake Missoula and and looking at that choke point at the so called ice dam. You know, that's a lot of water to get through a small point. Yes, Mike. Yes, and and you know. If you're forcing that much water through such a small constriction point, how does it become such a big flood in the Scablands then? I mean, it, it, it doesn't add up. There, there are several things about this that, this that don't add up. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah. Point. And as we go through it, I think you'll find there's quite a few things that don't add up. More and, you know, and, several, and, and, that's right. And about the strand lines, you, you, the theory that the strand lines are caused by multiple floods. Well, it would be real curious that each of these floods just happen to be uh, a little lower than the one before. A little right? lower than the previous <laughs> right. one on a on a yeah. on a rhythmic basis. You yeah. Said, oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> Very curious. Yeah. There, you know, there there are several questions there. Yes. I was, I the was ice dam was successively less dammy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was a measured retreat. <laughs> That's right. You know, okay. But yeah, I was I had questions. I just didn't want to interrupt you. You were on a roll. You just got okay. you just gotta just jump in, just Throw slam it in there, you know? Yeah, There's just no rudely it. jump in. That's you know? right. Exactly. Well, I'm not afraid of that. It's just I didn't want oh. to just, didn't want to <laughs> get you off on a digression because you were headed in a direction that I didn't want to disrupt. I was. That's right, yeah. Well, hopefully it's a proceed to it, yeah. <laughs> some of the questions can be answered and some of them need answers, so. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Well, adios, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, Good well night. done. Good night. Good night. Good night. Great show.